But what I'd like to look at now is what foods have an acid effect and what foods have an alkaline effect. And this will enable you to ensure that you're having a more alkaline diet. So we're going to have a look at alkaline foods and we're going to look at acid foods. And you might be surprised to see that the first alkaline food I'm putting up here is the humble lemon. And you might say, no, the lemon's acid. It is. And it's acid where it should be. There's only one part in the body that should be acid. You know where that is? Stomach. stomach. It must be acid. If someone says, I've got a very acid stomach, I say, praise God. <laughs> because if you don't have an acid stomach, you can't break your proteins down. How do you know it's acid? Well, it's sore. It's, well, you shouldn't feel it. I can't feel it. it. Means you haven't got a thick mucosa lining on the stomach. We're going to look at water tomorrow, and that's made up of water. Maybe it's because you're dehydrated. Remember, you've got to investigate. I gave a presentation last night to a, to a group, and we had questions at the end. And one question was, what can I do for high blood pressure? And I said, well, I can't answer that in 30 seconds. <laughs> but you can go to my YouTube lecture. What can we do for this? I said, well, all depends on why it's... What can I do for my sore finger? All depends on why the finger's sore. So you've got to investigate. So I actually referred them to lectures I have online where you, they can investigate. Everyone wants the, a quick fix. Sorry, there aren't any. <laughs> The quickest fix I know would have to be your hot and cold, your hot and cold treatments. You can get relief very quickly with your hot and cold water treatments. Now, the lemon is acid where it should be. That's why you'll find that most of our salad dressings have lemon in them. But when it is broken down in the gut and the minerals are dispersed, and absorbed into the blood and thus to the tissues, it has an alkaline effect because the lemon is high in the alkaline minerals, which is sodium and potassium, calcium, magnesium and iron. These are the alkaline minerals and the lemon is high in the alkaline minerals. Don't you love the lemon? Every home should have a lemon tree. And if you're in a unit, you can have a lemon tree in a pot on your veranda. Dark green leafy vegetables are also alkaline forming. Dark green leafy vegetables we should be eating every day. That's your kale, that's your parsley, that's your what you call them collard greens. Do you know I've never seen collard greens in Australia. You can tell I'm in Alabama. They're a popular food here, but we do have spinach and silver beet, kale. We should be eating something of from the dark green family of vegetables every single day. And if you don't, you really should have a dose of green barley or super greens. Also vegetables. Vegetables have an alkaline effect. But there is a question mark with vegetables. I'm putting a question mark here because for some people these have an alkaline effect and sometimes an acid effect. It's the tomato and bell pepper, or in Australia we call that capsicum. Also eggplant, and some countries call this aubergine. And last is the potato. Now this is not the sweet potato. The sweet potato is actually not a potato. The sweet potato is a yam. I'm referring to the English potato or the Irish potato. This is the nightshade group of vegetables and for some people they have an acid effect and for some people they have an alkaline effect. Let you let me tell you what I have found with me. My mother died at 51, a cripple in a wheelchair with rheumatoid arthritis. I have strong inherited genes to that way. And my body says to me, a little tomato now and then. My body says to me, don't even touch the bell pepper. What happens if I touch it? Oh, it repeats on me all afternoon and my energy just goes. So I say, I'm hearing your body and I don't eat it. The eggplant, I have a little eggplant now and then, maybe twice a month. Potato, 
My husband's an Irishman. Potatoes must be in every main meal, so I have it probably most days. That's what my body tells me. I don't know what your body will tell you. Now, I could have 10 professors in front of me saying, this is ridiculous, Barbara. The bell pepper is a very good vegetable. It is high in antioxidants and vitamin Cs. You should be eating it. Who am I going to listen to? I've got to live in this body. That's why the fine tuning is yours. N no man on the planet can tell you the fine tuning. Only your body can. We had one lady who conquered her arthritis. Isn't that good news? Yeah. <laughs> she conquered her arthritis by stopping the nightshades. It appears if you have an inflammatory condition in the body, the nightshades will feed that inflammation. She conquered her arthritis. She was in her 70s. Even her swollen joints came down. Isn't that good news? She said to me, do you think I could start eating that now? I said, you could try. Your body will quickly tell you. She told me later that her body lets her have half a tomato every second day. Her body does not let her have the bell pepper. Her body lets her have a little eggplant now and then, and she has potato a couple of times a week. She said, my body's happy with that. One lady said to me, I can have the green bell pepper, but not the red. Another lady said, well, I can have the red and not the green. Another lady said, I can have the raw and not the cooked. And another lady said, well, I can have the cooked and not the raw. I find that uh, my body's very happy with cayenne pepper, and yet that's from the, the capsicum of the bell pepper family. I think perhaps the medicinal properties of the, of the cayenne pepper may be far outweigh for me the reaction. So the choice is yours, the question mark's there. If you love this food, if you have no reaction and no arthritis, enjoy. When you cook the tomato with an oil, and I think you'll agree with me, olive oil and tomatoes go very nice. They almost hand in hand together. And you look at uh, Lebanese food, Italian food, there's a lot of tomato and olive oil cooking. When it's cooked with an oil, it releases a plant chemical called lycopene. Lycopene is from the fat soluble family and that's another reason why we should be eating a little oil with our meals because it helps release the fat soluble vitamins. Lycopene is a potent antioxidant and it has the ability to reduce the inflammation of the prostate gland. So that's good news, isn't it? So every man over the age of 40 should be having a cooked tomato and olive oil dish maybe three or four times a week. That's not hard. Lovely base for your, for your chickpeas, your tomatoes, your, sorry, it is tomatoes. For your, uh, in fact, that's, isn't that Mexican? Your, your kidney beans to have with your tacos or your tacos, I think you call them. Mm -hmm. Lima beans and lentils and soy are the three alkaline forming legumes. For your grains, the millet is alkaline. We had millet this morning, it's a delicious grain, isn't it? I'm sure you can understand when I said it needs to be dressed. <laughs> it's, it's, uh, it's basically a bland grain, but it's very nice with, um, with the stewed apple and the pear cream and the sprinkles on top. Or oh, it's also very nice if you have it with savoury, your, your lentils. Quinoa, I think we'll be having quinoa at another breakfast time. These are alkaline grains, but they're also gluten-free grains, so that's made them very popular. Amaranth. Amaranth is a grain that's not very well known. I think the Aztecs, um, traditionally they've eaten the quinoa and the amaranth. It's a very tiny grain, and when you cook it, it goes like a lump of glue. But, if, but what I often do when my grandsons are with us, because they like a porridge, I'll put a little amaranth with the millet, or I'll put a little amaranth with the quinoa, or if they have oats, I'll put a little amaranth with the oats. So that, that's quite nice. Spelt. Spelt and kamut are wild hybrids of the original wheat. So let me give you the wheat story. The original wheat that God made 
is called Enkenhorn, or some call it just Enkhorn. And that original wheat had a very fragile protein or gluten structure. It is not so when, but they estimate a couple of thousand years ago, Enkenhorn did a wild hybrid with a field grass and came up with the Emma strain of wheat. Its, its structure, its protein or gluten structure is not as fragile, but it's still fairly fragile. And in the 1950s, it was the Emma strain of wheat that was put through intensive crossbreeding. And it came up with the hybridized wheat that we know today. That hybridization of the wheat created an incredibly complex starch, sorry, not starch, gluten or protein structure. Yesterday we looked at the starch that was changed, but today we're looking at how the hybridization process changed the gluten or the protein structure. And it's almost only a cast iron gut that can break down that very complex protein or, or um, gluten structure. That explains why so many people are gluten intolerant today. You look at the timeline. So it was the 1950s that the wheat was hybridized. It was the 1970s that it went worldwide. So by the 1990s, every pasta, every pizza, every biscuit, cake, cookie, donut, cereal, bread, it's all made out of the hybridized wheat. You see, the farmers love it, and I don't blame them for loving it because they get six times more grain per acre. Who wouldn't like that? They've got to pay their bills. But as I mentioned yesterday, it was zoomed through to help with the starvation crisis in the world, and safety studies were never done. This explains the gluten intolerance that we see today. The two most common symptoms of a gluten intolerance is brain fog and bloating. I meet so many people that have brain fog and bloating, and they almost think it's normal, or it can be blamed on age. Poor old age gets blamed for so many things. Isn't that true? Now this Emma wheat, it also did a wild hybrid to come up with a field grass and came up with the spelt. So the spelt, it it has retained the fairly fragile structure and if that spelt meal is made into a sourdough bread, the culturing process in the sourdough bread breaks down that protein or gluten structure even more so that it now has the original structure of the Enkenhorn. If someone is celiac, they, they cannot have even the spelt. But if someone's gluten intolerant or gluten sensitive, they can usually handle the spelt, especially if it's made into a sourdough bread. One lady said, I don't like sourdough spelt bread. I said, well, you haven't tasted a good one. Please taste a few. <laughs> Some are really good. So you have to investigate. I'm going to give you a website. And this is of a young man named Tristan, it's his family business, and he sells the most beautiful sourdough spelt, sourdough kamut bread. It's www.simpleneeds. And he ships all over. That's not right, that's needs. Sorry, and that's not right. It's a D. Simpleneeds.com. It is the most beautiful sourdough, spelt and kamut bread I have tasted. I think he has a rye, have a few different varieties. Some people order it on Friday, so when they get home on Monday, <laughs> it's coming to their doorstep. It's already sliced, so it's very easy to put in the freezer and take a, a slice out now and then. So this explains what happened to the wheat. And if you'd like to pursue that a little bit more, you can get the book Wheat Belly. There's another book called Life Without Bread. Dr. Natasha Campbell McBride, she also talks about the effect of the wheat on the gut and thus the brain. So there are a few books that talk about it. So coming back to our alkaline forming foods, 
The two nuts are your almond and Brazil. And all your seeds have an alkaline effect. So what has an acid effect? Before we go there, there's one other, is fruit. Now I've got a question mark with fruit too. Why have I got a question mark? If someone has a yeast presence in their body and they're eating a lot of fruit, the sugar in the fruit will feed the yeast. And as the yeast feeds on the sugars in the fruit, it gives off acetic acid. It gives off lactic acid. It gives off uric acid. So it basically is feathering its nest. So when a person has a yeast presence and they're eating a lot of fruit, can you see that they are feeding the problem? And they're creating the environment of 5.5 where yeast loves to live. And alcohol is also given off. Alcohol breaks down in the body to acetaldehyde. And acetaldehyde is a neurotoxin. We don't want a neurotoxin. A neurotoxin is a brain killer. There are five places you can be exposed to acetaldehyde. Yes, if someone consumes alcohol. Yes, if someone has a yeast problem and they're having a lot of fruit, it will break down to this. Cigarette smoke, car fumes give off acetaldehyde. And the last one is vinegar. We don't use vinegar here. We use lemon. Lemon is far superior. Let's have a look at acid forming foods now. These acid forming foods are high in the acid forming minerals, which is phosphorus, sulfur, and chlorine. So what foods are high in phosphorus, sulfur, and chlorine? Meat. This explains why Dr. Colin Campbell found he could turn cancer cells on and off like a switch by the amount of meat and dairy products he was giving the rats. Refined sugar, it's very acid forming. The hybridized wheat, the hybridization of the wheat created a lot more of the acid forming minerals. Aged cheese, What's the blue in the blue vein cheese? The blue in the blue vein cheese is mold. So the only cheeses that don't sit under that category, the cheeses that have probably a pH of seven would be your fresh. So that's your uh, cottage, your uh, ricotta. I'm not saying that they are okay because usually they come from cows who have not been fed right or have chemicals in them. But on the pH scale, they're not as, as acid. Caffeine, all your caffeine foods and drinks have an acid effect. And of course, caffeine usually comes hand in hand with the sugar, which certainly ups it. And remember our 2.6 Coca-Cola, that's a combination of the caffeine and the sugar. Did you know that Coca-Cola is called Coca-Cola? Because I think it was in the early part of the, the 20th century, they put, they put cocaine in it. <laughs> and then they went over to caffeine, which is just as dangerous. Alcohol is not a food, but it creates an acid environment in the body. Tobacco is not a food, but it also creates an acid environment in the body. All your other grains, other than the grains that sit on the alkaline side. All your other legumes, other than the lima, lentil and soy. And all your other nuts, other than the almond and Brazil, have an acid effect. To maintain the 6.5 environment, 
we need to be consuming 20% acid forming foods and 80%, 70 to 80% alkaline forming foods. And I'm sure you're not surprised to hear me say that the 20% should come from this section here. Yes, oatmeal is here. Yes, rice is here. They're not bad grains. We need a little acid. Yes, your chickpeas are here and your garbanzos, your, chi your chickpeas, your black-eyed beans, your kidney beans. They're not bad. Of course they're not bad. We need a little acid. It's when the whole meal is acid that tips the scales. How many, how many Americans would be eating 90% acid, 10% alkaline? Is that true? No wonder cancer and heart disease are neck to neck for the number one killers in the world today. Far more people die from alcohol-related diseases. Far more people die from tobacco-related diseases. And yet they're not banning tobacco or alcohol, are they? That's why the deaths to COVID fade into insignificance against all of these. That's why God gave us a sound mind to assess these things. Are you familiar with the hydrangea plant? The hydrangea plant's a beautiful big bush and it has big flowers about this big and each flower is made up of actually a whole lot of tiny little flowers. And sometimes you'll see a hydrangea plant with blue flowers, sometimes purple flowers, sometimes hot pink flowers, sometimes pale pink flowers. They're not different types of hydrangea plant. The gardener plays with the pH of the soil because different pHs create different colored flowers. There's a massage house in the town near us. Well, it's an hour away. We're from an hour from a town. And it's an old house that's been painted purple. And out the front, they've got big hydrangea plants. And the purple is the same color as the paint that painted the house. I'm wondering how long it took them to play with the pH of the soil just to get the, just to get the right color. Just as the gardener plays with the pH of the soil to get the right color flower, you can play with the pH of your soil, I mean cell, to create different health and sicknesses conditions in the body. One of the easiest ways to do it is eat more vegetables, eat more greens. Start pursuing the other grains. And little by little, without your family even realizing it, you be can begin to create an alkaline environment in your family. When you go home, remember that everyone's going to be a little bit afraid of you because you've just been to a health retreat for a week and they, they're going to think that you're going to knock them over the head with health. You know, the best thing to do is to say very little and just create the most beautiful food. And then when they say to you, all right, what have you done? You can say, I'm so glad you asked. <laughs> then you can speak. So you can see also with the blue zone, these people that live the long knife, they're eating a lot of fresh foods. If you cook the food, does it come acid? No. Whether it's cooked or whether it's raw, it doesn't change the mineral content of the food. The only time you will lose your minerals is if you cook your vegetables in water and throw the veg vegetable water away. Every evening we're giving you a broth. You're drinking all that vegetable water. It's very high in minerals. We're going to have a break now. When we come back from the break, we're going to look at fantastic fats. <laughs> 